and it should be recording. Uh, I'll let any of you tell me if anything happens to the video, not that you've got to have my face in it all the time, by screen sharing also, one of the advantages of screen sharing is that uh, you, you do get to look at whatever is up most of the time instead of a, a big picture of my face um, uh, or even just all of the others. Uh, and so you should, anytime we use a video, uh, you should be able to. So this is our first Saturday uh, class in Old Testament Prophets 2 here at Southwest Houston at Solutions Church. And um, we're grateful as we start kick off the, the semester, the spring semester here. Um, for SHBI, we're in our 75th year, I believe. I have to go back and look. Finishing 74, 75. Uh, obviously, I haven't been around for all of those, but uh, uh, thankful for the last 13 years that I've been able to be here and uh, to be involved in this, this good ministry and grateful for the technology, the avenue of being able to do this online uh, together with in person for those that can't make it in person and even from other places. Now, instead of having people just from the Houston area, we have them signing up from around Texas, Virginia, uh, and uh, usually if they're not joining us live from overseas, Africa or India or Pakistan, and they're usually watching later. So, so we're going to uh, dive into a continuation of our last semester class, Prophets 1, where we did Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. Now we pick up with Ezekiel and go on through Daniel, <clears throat> on through Malachi. Uh, I want to, because we will be using some of the Bible Project videos as we go, I want to show you a, an, an introductory one that uh, I just discovered. And uh, only two minutes. And it will help you to understand even just how their videos are arranged. And so we'll get that one going here. Library overview. This is our entire video library. Each video is a short five to 10 minute visual explanation that shows how the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. We've got a big library. So here is a quick overview of everything. All our videos are organized into on, one of folks. six. We just don't have the audio, my audio from mine. I think you can hear online if I'm not mistaken, because uh, I know Ignatius was getting it. But um, uh, I don't believe he had the, uh, the audio on. Uh, for the system here. You can let me know, Ignatius, when you have it. Is your phone mute? No, I'm not using uh, the phone. This is straight off of the computer. And uh, he just, uh, it ported. When Ah, there it is, in a big way. He just hadn't turned on the audio in the, in the building here. Categories, we call them series. Our biggest one is the overview series. This series has illustrated summaries of every book in the Bible. These videos give you a visual overview of the shape of each book in the Bible and its core themes. Lots of people use these while studying a specific book of the Bible or while reading through the Bible as a whole. The next largest set of videos is our How to Read the Bible series. This series is made up of 19 videos that will introduce you to the different literary genres in the Bible. These videos will help you understand things like how biblical narrative uses character, setting, and plot to communicate important ideas, or how Hebrew poetry works a little differently than the poetry you might be used to. These videos will also cover biblical discourse from the letters of the apostles to the laws of ancient Israel. Another one of our series covers major themes found in the Bible. Making sense of some of the big themes in the Bible can bring the entire biblical story into focus. The major themes are introduced in the first few pages of the Bible. 
weaving throughout the whole story and finding their climax in the life of Jesus. Our theme videos give you an overview of the entire biblical story and will introduce you to key biblical concepts. Our word study series introduces another fascinating way to approach the biblical story. This series dives deep into significant Hebrew or Greek words found in scripture. In these videos, you won't just learn biblical vocabulary. You'll also see the entire story of scripture through the lens of one key word. Our visual commentary series is one of the newest categories of videos. These videos look at smaller sections of the Bible and the literary shape and design of a specific passage or verse. These videos will give you a better understanding of key passages in scripture. The final category is a series of animated explorations of larger sections of the Bible. We have the Luke Acts series, which walks through the narrative of Jesus and his apostles as recorded in Luke Acts. We have the Torah series that explores the first five books of the Bible. And our wisdom series looks at the three wisdom books as one collection, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. No matter where you start watching, we're glad you're here. The Bible is a divinely inspired work of literary art that invites us into a lifetime of meditation. Are you ready to learn more? Let's jump in. All right. And that's just at BibleProject.com. And so you can go there. And it was just helpful to see that's a new one where they bring all of those in together. Um, let me double check on... All right. Uh, then I want to do a brief uh, intro here uh, from one of the books that's helpful as I go through this. Uh, it's down here at the bottom, Daniel Hayes, no kin to me, H-A-Y-S, uh, and not just about the book of Daniel. This is the message of the prophets survey of the prophetic and apocalyptic books of the Old Testament. And uh, so this is true of nearly all the prophets. So look at this uh, there on your screen or up here within the Mosaic Covenant context, primarily defined by Deuteronomy, where God established that covenant with Israel and within the historical context of the looming expansionistic world powers of Assyria and Babylon, the message of the prophets can be summarized by the following three basic points. You, Israel and Judah, Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, have broken the covenant. You had better repent. No repentance, then it's judgment. Judgment will also come on the nations. So it's it's not just judgment on, on uh, Israel and Judah, Northern and Southern Kingdoms, but also on the nations around for their complicity. And three, there is hope beyond the judgment for a glorious future restoration for both Israel, Judah and the nations. So God's only concern is not Israel and Judah. It is, he's always concerned for the nations. And then uh, just see this segment here. Uh, a major part of this theme is that the theological and relational picture of Yahweh's people in the future will be different and better. And so these are some of the things that we see in uh, nearly all of these components in Ezekiel. There will be a new Exodus, though there's not much about the return to Jerusalem or none about the return to Jerusalem in Ezekiel, there will be a new exodus. Instead of out of Egypt, it will be out of Babylon. But later, eventually, the greater exodus will be what? Jesus, the new Moses, leading all the people of the world out of the bondage of sin. And so it anticipates that a new covenant, Jeremiah 31, we did that last time, 31-31 in Ezekiel 30. Uh, 6 and 37, and a new, a new presence of Yahweh's indwelling spirit. Uh, so not just in this temple made by hands, but what temple? In the, the temple of our bodies, like 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says. So just a little bit of, of uh, helpful information there. Uh, then I want to go, as we get ready to go into Ezekiel, if you read uh, Eugene Peterson's The Message, translation of the Bible, when you get to, before Isaiah, the section on the prophets, he has an introduction. And uh, Peterson is an excellent teacher and scholar of the Bible. And his introduction, it's about, uh, even though here it'll be about six minutes to listen to, and you can see it written. Whoops, I can't do it on the newer phones, 
uh, I'll just play it here off the computer, about seven minutes for this introduction and listen to it. There's nothing, there won't be any text on the screen, uh, but listen, uh, all of you online there, I just rely on you to let me know if anything uh, goes wrong, even if you have to call in or text uh, my number. Uh, I'm on and uh, if, the, if I lose connection somehow and I'm not aware of it, uh, you may not have yours monitoring the whole time, right? I'll get my other phone later and set it up to where it'll be a constant monitor, but y'all can text me or call me and let me know. So let's listen to this uh, intro uh, to the prophets. I think. Uh, again, no problem with it this morning. But, uh, yeah, I have, I'm, on, I'm hot spotting it there. We should be hearing it up through, through there. If I don't get it now, that's okay. I will. Um, I will have to uh, skip that one for now. That's okay. That's not not a crucial part. Uh, I'll come back to it uh, afterwards. Let me close out that one and see if that helps any. Uh, if I had, I do have my adapter. Hold on. I do have it here. So folks. Powering on. I did dry run through all of the technical issues last night and this morning, so at least know that I made effort to get it all working, but it's understandable that glitches will arise on the spot. Introduction to the profits. Over a period of several hundred maximum volume, birth to an extraordinary number of profits, men and women distinguished by the power and skill with which they presented the reality of God. They delivered God's commands and promises and living presence to communities and nations who had been living on God fantasies and God lives. Everyone more or less believes in God, but most of us do our best to keep God on the margins of our lives. Or failing that, we fashion God to suit our convenience. Prophets insist that God is the sovereign center, not off in the wings awaiting our beck and call. And prophets insist that we deal with God as God reveals himself, not as we imagine him to be. These men and women woke people up to the sovereign presence of God in their lives. They yelled, they wept, they rebuked, they soothed, they challenged, they comforted. They used words of power and imagination, whether blunt or subtle. Sixteen of these prophets wrote what they spoke. We call them the writing prophets. They comprise the section from Isaiah to Malachi in our Bibles. These 16 Hebrew prophets provide the help we so badly need if we're to stay alert and knowledgeable regarding the conditions in which we cultivate faithful and obedient lives before God. For the ways of the world, its assumptions, its values, its methods of going about its work are never on the side of God, never. The prophets purge our imaginations of this world's assumptions on how life is lived and what counts in life. Over and over again, God the Holy Spirit uses these prophets to separate his people from the cultures in which they live, putting them back on the path of simple faith and obedience and worship in defiance of all that the world admires and rewards. Prophets train us in discerning the difference between the ways of the world and the ways of the gospel, keeping us present to the presence of God. We don't read very many pages into the prophets before realizing that there was nothing easy going about them. Prophets were not popular figures. They never achieved celebrity status. They were decidedly uncongenial 
to the temperaments and dispositions of the people with whom they live. And the centuries have not mellowed them. It's understandable that we should have a difficult time coming to terms with them. They aren't particularly sensitive to our feelings. They have very modest, as we would say, relationship skills. We like leaders, especially religious leaders, who understand our problems. Come alongside us is our idiom for it. Leaders with a touch of glamour, leaders who look good on posters and on television. The hard rock reality is that prophets don't fit into our way of life. For a people who are accustomed to fitting God into their lives, or as we like to say, making room for God, the prophets are hard to take and easy to dismiss. The God of whom the prophets speak is far too large to fit into our lives. If we want anything to do with God, we have to fit into him. The prophets are not reasonable, accommodating themselves to what makes sense to us. They are not diplomatic, tactfully negotiating an agreement that allows us a say in the outcome. What they do is haul us unceremoniously into a reality far too large to be accounted for by our explanations and expectations. They plunge us into mystery, immense and staggering. Their words and visions penetrate the illusions with which we cocoon ourselves from reality. We humans have an enormous capacity for denial and for self-deceit. We incapacitate ourselves from dealing with the consequences of sin, for facing judgment, for embracing truth. Then the prophets step in and help us to first recognize and then enter the new life God has for us, the life that hope in God opens up. They don't explain God. They shake us out of old conventional habits of small mindedness, of trivializing God gossip and set us on our feet in wonder and obedience and worship. If we insist on understanding them before we live into them, we will never get it. Basically, the prophets did two things. They worked to get people to accept the worst as God's judgment, not a religious catastrophe or a political disaster, but judgment. If what seems like the worst turns out to be God's judgment, it can be embraced, not denied or avoided, for God is good and intends our salvation. So judgment, while certainly not what we human beings anticipate in our planned future, can never be the worst that can happen. It is the best, for it is the work of God to set the world and us right. And the prophets work to get people who were beaten down to open themselves up to hope in God's future. In the wreckage of exile and death and humiliation and sin, the prophet ignited hope, opening lives to the new work of salvation that God is about at all times and everywhere. One of the bad habits that we pick up early in our lives is separating things and people into secular and sacred. We assume that the secular is what we are more or less in charge of. Our jobs, our time, our entertainment, our government, our social relations. The sacred is what God has charge of, worship and the Bible, heaven and hell, church and prayers. We then contrive to set aside a sacred place for God, designed, we say, to honor God, but really intended to keep God in his place leaving us free to have the final say about everything else that goes on. Prophets will have none of this. They contend that everything, absolutely everything, takes place on sacred ground. God has something to say about every aspect of our lives, the way we feel and act in the so-called privacy of our hearts and homes, the way we make our money and the way we spend it, the politics we embrace, the wars we fight, the catastrophes we endure, the people we hurt and the people we help. Nothing is hidden from the scrutiny of God. Nothing is exempt from the rule of God. Nothing escapes the purposes of God. Holy, holy, holy. Prophets make it impossible to evade God or make detours around God. Prophets insist on receiving God in every nook and cranny of life. For a prophet, God is more real than the next door neighbor. No, I want to talk about the All right. So I just find that helpful in getting some orientation uh, on uh, on the prophets uh, and a couple of things that Peterson says there that uh, I think it would be helpful to remember. One is that even when judgment's involved, that there's good to come from that. We don't even have to dread judgment. Sometimes we'll you know we'll hear uh, we may even say it ourselves about God's judgment that must come on America because of sin and and sure it's not a pleasant thing it's like hebrews 12 talks about that long section that talks about discipline the discipline of the lord he said it's not a pleasant thing when it's happening but it's always for our good and in that it's it would it really would help us as believers to keep that in mind that that you know the day of the lord the day of judgment uh we 
uh, and yes, of course, there's some language, some apocalyptic language about it being dark and foreboding. But the way that I think we in the kingdom need to perceive that is that even when there's the judgment of God, it's for purification, it's for healing, it's for restoration. And in that sense, we don't have to dread or fear the judgment of God. Now, of course, one of the best things that what we need to do at home is our own, our own internal housekeeping. And we need to sanctify ourselves for the Lord to, to be obedient to the Lord so that he's not having to discipline us in conjunction with or in, a, in addition to what's happening out in the world. Because uh, it, it certainly is unpleasant whenever we're in rebellion against the Lord. We have unrepented sin, and he's having then to deal with us also. And then uh, where Peterson notes that we as humans, we have this tendency, uh, strong tendency, to always want to divide between the secular, the secular and the sacred. And we, we have to get around that. We have to stop doing that, that every bit of our life is sacred. We can't divide it, workplace or, or church, fellowship or home. Every bit of our life is sacred. And the prophets keep holding that mirror up to us and saying, no, how you conduct your businesses, how you are at home, how you treat your employees, all of these things matter to God. So I pray, you know, that's helpful as we uh, get ready and to, to dive in. Now I'm going to wait on <clears throat> just the uh, read scripture, the Bible Project read scripture video on the first part of Ezekiel until we, until after our break. Uh, and so we'll go ahead and just take the, the time right now, the chance now to uh, get into the text. So go ahead and open your Bibles up to Ezekiel. Finished uh, just before Christmas, early December. Uh, with Jeremiah and didn't get to go through uh, uh, hardly any of Lamentations itself, except noting that well-known passage. Uh, but now we come to Ezekiel. And so you, when they say the major and minor prophets, again, it's not because Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel are more important than the others. They're larger books. They're more substantial uh, writings. And so that's the sense in which we have major the Jews themselves don't refer to them as major and minor, former and latter prophets. Uh, Ezekiel is a contemporary of Jeremiah. So there's overlap between their lives in ministry, not in scripture itself, but in the timetable. So Jeremiah preceded, uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah preceded Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Uh, you don't have that, you know, they're not contemporaries. <clears throat> with let's see uh let me go ahead and uh, do this so again uh all of you there i trust that it's sharing the screen okay i'll just have to hear from uh from you but uh, i'll put it up full screen where you'll be able to see it a little bit better, not see so much of the rest of my screen. Uh, message of the prophets, 586 is a central point. It's the, it's the kind of the fulcrum of history of Israel. That's the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple. And 586 falls in the middle of all three of these books. And you can look at uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel and see how the destruction uh, is mentioned. They're arranged, and so the major themes in the books are judgment, because they've broken the covenant, loss, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, and then hope, hope for a future uh, that you see in all three of them, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and of course we know what is it, uh, Jeremiah, 
2911. Uh, I have a hope for you in the future, uh, which we can take out of context, but that was in the midst of destruction. That was in the midst of suffering. So, and it's not hope just for the people of God, but hope for the nations as well. So in judgment sections of the books uh, in Isaiah, especially one through 12, Jeremiah 1 through 29, and Ezekiel is chapters 1 through 24. Uh, now, all of these, uh, power, the PowerPoint, uh, this one's been modified a bit. I will recopy it uh, when, I get, when I get home. Uh, but uh, just make sure I make a note to do it. Already, the link that I sent you to Dropbox has... Uh, the first three units, and uh, there is this PowerPoint on there, but uh, this one, as I said, has been changed a bit. Uh, there, we've already we've already talked about uh, the major uh, size, not importance. Uh, the, the kingdom divided after Solomon under Rehoboam in 933 BC, and uh, so the years of disobedience for Israel for the Northern Kingdom, it was pretty much all of it. Uh, 300, about 350 years or so of the northern kingdom's disobedience. For Judah, they were obedient off and on for a longer period. Uh, but uh, still, uh, what is it, at least uh, uh, 40 to plus years of disobedience. The prophets address the southern kingdom Judah, the northern kingdom Israel, and other nations. A prophet is one who speaks for another uh, prophet spoke forth for God. We think of prophecy as nearly all foretelling the future. So, but it's not, they say about probably three quarters of the prophets is forth telling, not F-O-R-E foretelling, but forth telling the word of God speaking, uh, God's relevant message to the people and the culture of the time. And so even today, there can be someone who speaks prophetically to, uh, to us, our lives, our culture to America, other names, seer, man of God. Uh, the work of the prophets first came on the scene from the falling away of Israel, the northern, and then the southern tribes. The priesthood was hereditary from Aaron. It became corrupt. The prophets were called directly by God and sent to warn the people. And the miss mission and message of the prophets to save the nation from idolatry, to announce the destruction if they didn't repent, to foretell the preservation of a remnant of God's people, to foretell the coming of a savior, a Messiah, who would bring not only Israel, uh, but all nations to God from the line of David, a branch sprouting from David's ancestry. And the timing of when the prophets wrote uh, between, and a lot of this is in your notes, between 800 and 400 BC, Jerusalem fell 586. Prophets before the fall of Jerusalem, Joel, Jonah, Amos, o Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, Zephaniah, Nahum, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, and Obadiah. So a lot of the other minor prophets will be dealing with before the fall, during the captivity, Daniel and Ezekiel. And during the restoration uh, from Babylon, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Some of the benefits from studying the prophets, we meet God, learn of his mind, his nature. We learn lessons for our, our lives, our church, our nation. We learn more about the heart of God, the ways of God, and then we're strengthened by seeing the fulfillment of prophecy. Now, uh, one thing, avoiding extremes. Uh, some can avoid the prophets because of the difficult symbolism uh, where it's uh, very figurative, uh, apocalyptic uh, language. But on the other hand, some can get all wrapped up in the prophecies, take them out of context, assign speculative uh, end times interpretations which don't have a, a good foundation in scripture itself. Many OT, Old Testament prophecies already fulfilled. Not all of them have a dual fulfillment. Many of them do, or even a tertiary, a third fulfillment. Uh, setting dates for the end, the return of Christ has repeatedly fell throughout history. And Jesus saying, no one knows. Only the father, not the son, not the angels. Uh, but also, sensationalizing uh, prophecies, speculative interpretation. It can make it hard for uh, people who just really want to 
think through it. It can make it hard to believe when we're when we are uh, uh, irresponsible with our reading of scripture. Yes. Uh, I was just, you know, reflecting on the last presidential election about you know many of the false prophets who proclaimed that Trump was going to win. No. You know, and really deceived a lot of Christians. And, yeah. And up to now, a lot of them have not even come out to say, listen, uh, we missed it. Com comment on it. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Find you when you say it. Yeah, Ignatius. And, and I, if I could, I'll repeat it here so that they'll yeah. pick it up. Yeah. Uh, just Ignatius mentioning that uh, before the election, some of the prophets that, of course, it proved to be false prophecy that Trump was going to win. And even since then, not really some coming, none, some of them not coming back out and saying, oops, we were wrong. I uh, can just go silent on it. But that's one of the criteria that we'll see about uh, that even scripture give, gives about prophecy. You'll know that a person is a true prophet of God if what he says, he or she says, comes true. Uh, so, yes, we, we need to, we, just as the New Testament's constantly warning us, we need to be alert. Uh, we don't need to be duped by someone, to be like the, the Berean Christians uh, that uh, took everything that Paul said and compared it, measured it by the word of God. And that's the way we need to be. Uh, I'm gonna go back and just uh, for now, stay, uh, stay on this. So open up there to Ezekiel. So there were three times before the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 by the Babylonians. So the Assyrian world empire, they were the dominant world empire at the time of the Northern Kingdom, and they destroyed uh, Samaria, the Northern Kingdom, in 721. So 621, you know, over 100 years later, now the Babylonians have risen to be the dominant world power, and they've started invading the land of Judah the small outlying cities in 606, they make the first, uh, you know, kind of siege of Jerusalem, attack on Jerusalem. They take away some. They come back about 10 years later in 597 and take 10,000 in 597 BC. And Ezekiel went in that uh, deportation. Uh, and Daniel, I, I'd have to, we'll look when we get there. Uh, I believe some uh, say and believe that Daniel was taken in the first deportation in 606. They, so they both were in captivity, but not in the same place. Uh, Ezekiel was out in the countryside because as we start in chapter one, he was by the river Kibar with the captives. So Daniel, you should remember, is in the capital with Nebuchadnezzar. He's in Babylon itself. So they're in Babylonia, the country. Babylon's the capital, so they're both in Babylonia, but uh, here Ezekiel is out in the countryside. Ezekiel was a priestly family. He, he's about 30 years old when it's interesting how many ministries get inaugurated at 30 years of age. Jesus is, was one, and he would have, at 30 years of age, he would have been, he would have been qualified to become a priest back in Jerusalem, but he's not there. He's in captivity. And, uh, but as a priest, uh, different from Jeremiah, uh, he is going to draw more heavily on Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, uh, than, you know, unlike Isaiah and Jeremiah. Um, and Ezekiel is about God's exile from his own temple because of the sin of his people. And we'll, we'll see that as we go on through that, that God is not welcome in his his own home his own place in his own temple uh and of course the parallel if we bring it down to us today again we look at our bodies as temples of the holy spirit and and if we're if we're really thinking through it we will we will make these parallels constantly as we read through here what they were doing to the temple of god there in jerusalem are we guilty in any way uh making god unwelcome and in the temple of our bodies. And then not just us individually, because it's not all about just us individually. It's about us collectively as the people of God. So 
his church are we making God welcome in his church? And it, and it would vary. Of course, as you look at the state of the church throughout the U.S. and around the world, some are, are, are managing to be faithful in a better way than others that are uh, succumbing to the culture, adapting uh, to the ways, of the, the ways of the world more. So, morning. Uh, yes. How are you? How are you? Good. Who do we have there? Okay. Uh, so, go. Uh, I think we're good. So we'll go ahead and look here. Uh, I think I'm still good. Yep. Ezekiel 1, 1, 1, in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, the heavens uh, were opened and I saw visions of God. Uh, and then he... He goes on in the fifth of the month, on the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of, Je of King Jehoiakim. So I believe Jehoiakim was killed back in Jerusalem. Jehoiakim was a puppet king, a vassal king that was set up and he was in exile. It says the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the priest by the Kibar River. Uh, and then he looks and sees uh, the vision the windstorm, verse 4, coming uh, out of the north. And then the living creatures, verse 5, the four living creatures. In chapter 10, I believe in verse 20, is where he will refer to them as cherubim. But here, in the beginning, he just calls them these living creatures. And it's interesting, his vision, now who else had a vision that when we did the other two prophets, who had a major vision? You have Isaiah there in chapter 6. Uh, when he beheld the, uh, the Lord and all of his glory in the train of his robe filled the temple. Uh, but that was all kind of back where it was supposed to be in Jerusalem. Here, he's in exile. So what's the presence of God doing? You know, as people tend to think of God as being more of a territorial uh, God. What's he, what's he doing out of the box, out of the temple in Jerusalem? Here in Babylonia, appearing to Ezekiel. Well, of course, we would say part of it is, well, he's the God of heaven and earth. But also, again, that he was run out of his special place, the temple there in Jerusalem, because of the sins of the, of the people. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about that vision. We're not going to go through that, because today we'll work through a number of the chapters again. As always, if you have something in here that is of specific interest to you uh, don't hesitate to uh, speak up you can unmute yourself i think each one of you can do that on uh, individually so just like if you were in the classroom that is again one of the benefits of zoom is instead of just having to send in a chat message and i'm not seeing chat messages by the way so if you i'd have to go to a different screen in order to see the chat messages so if you have something pressing or burning and you just unmute yourself and and uh, speak up and get my attention that way. Uh, you go on through the vision, look down at verse 26 about the expanse over their heads, what looked like the throne of sapphire and high, high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw from what appeared to be his waist up, looked like glowing metal. And then you go on down uh, to the end of it in 28. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down and heard the voice of one speaking. Uh, so just notice Ezekiel's response. When I saw this glory of the Lord, this the kabod in Hebrew glory uh, is kabod. It's like the weight. It, it refers to the, the weight of the presence of God. When I saw it, I fell face down. So one, and maybe he could do no other response, but 
one thing that we want to take away from that is to not lose our capacity for reverence. We, we all need to have the capacity uh, to, to be in awe of God. If there's never a moment in our worship, whether individually or corporately, uh, driving down the road, listening to the radio or whatever, there's never a moment where we're, where we're overcome with the presence of God. Uh, we, we should seek it, not just an emotional experience, not saying we need to just seek an ex emotional experience, but we need to just make sure we practice on a daily basis being in awe of God, because that's an attribute of a child. They don't hide the wonder on their faces and they're not they're not too uh all together and put together to to show their excitement and we're to be childlike not childish but childlike so we need to have that capacity and even if we don't feel the accompanying emotion we need to say to the lord uh just speak speak to him our gratitude our our awe and our wonder and if emotions don't follow, that's that's fine. We we want to to be sure and speak of the goodness of the Lord. Ezekiel fell face down, and then he said to me, "Son of man." And so Ezekiel, it looks you know, it pretty much seems like the book is autobiographical because he he writes in the first person a lot, uh, using the first person pronouns. He said to me, uh, "Son of man," and that's a name that you know. Through the spirit yes but ezekiel uses uh and i don't know the number of times many times throughout the book mm -hmm. and it's just denoting in, in contrast to this vision of god to the the sovereignty of god it's one of the things that it's telling us is ezekiel's acknowledging god is god i am not i am dust i am flesh i am human and I really think that that's the way that we ought to take Jesus and you. The main way that Jesus refers to himself is like Ezekiel, son of man. Now, some will take that and attach a real heavy prophetic element to it and say, well, he's using it like the Daniel passage. Uh, but that's a, and, and it very well may be, we're not going not gonna to come to blows over that. That's a one-time usage there. And, and so definitely, of course, Jesus, there's other ways that he's, his divinity is referred to. I think the point that Jesus would be making in talking about son of, referring to himself, son of man, it's just like Ezekiel. I am one of you. I, I understand what it is to be human. And so uh, that, that was helpful to me. Verse two, the spirit came down into me, raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking. So the spirit came into me, raised me up. It makes me think of Psalm 138.3. I cried to the Lord and he made me bold and stout hearted. When we, when we call upon the Lord, give us strength, give us our daily bread, help us in a situation. We acknowledge our dependence on him and not just relying, relying on our intellect or our acumen, uh, we call upon the Lord, and he can make us bold and stout-hearted. Uh, and, and that's very key to our relationship with God. The understanding that he's God and we're not. Yeah. I will never be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So true. Ignatius just saying that is crucial to our understanding of our relationship with God. He's God and we are not. I always think of it in, in Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. Recognize he is God and I am not. And I, and I try to do that daily, to even just briefly. Mm -hmm. And there is a relief, a weight off of our shoulders of sometimes trying to play God, mm -hmm. feeling like it all depends on us. And uh, we, we can follow the old adage, pray as if everything depends on God. Get up and act like it all depends on you. Well, we just need to... Uh, temper that a little bit. We get up and we don't in five minutes say everything depends on you, God. And then for the t remaining 20, you know, 23 hours of the day, act like it all depends on us. High blood pressure, everything else will be the result of that. Mm -hmm. It is getting up 
and working in partnership in conjunction with God that he's with us in all that we're that we're doing uh, he doesn't he doesn't abandon the temple whenever we get up and start going through our day even, even at, um, we use the word partnership the why the word partnership it, it has to be temporary too because there's that feeling that you know without us god can't be or god can't do yeah yeah right yeah just as ignatius is saying even partnership we need to keep in mind that god is sovereign mm -hmm. and he he can act apart from us mm -hmm. and without us and so that's that's true and then the flip side of that we do need to keep in mind because the unguarded side of that if we're if we're lazy spiritually we will say well he's going to do what he wants to do and and from everything that we see in it and i know that's not what you're saying but that's what we have to guard against so well god's sovereign and for some it can make it hard to pray well why pray because he's going to do what he wants to do anyway but from what we see in scripture in god's sovereignty is what is established is the fact that god is sovereign we know that but in that sovereignty he has limited himself to partnering with us to our asking you do not have james three you don't have i'm sorry james four four there's two key verses at the beginning of each of those first chapter four you don't have because you don't ask so uh that yes partnership but always remembering god is the senior partner he is the sovereign one uh look at what whenever he calls Jer uh, ezekiel to speak in verse six and you son chapter two verse six and you son of man what don't be afraid of them or their words don't be afraid though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions don't be afraid of what they say or terrified by them so three times in one verse what's he saying to son of man to this human don't be afraid don't be afraid i say don't be afraid again the most common command in scripture 365 or 366 times don't be afraid and we need that in the time of the pandemic and going forward uh you know political situation whether we like it or not to hear that don't be afraid don't be afraid of them don't fear what they fear don't call conspiracy what they call conspiracy we need to be careful in getting caught up in all the conspiracy theories that can float around out there god is calling us to something more centered than what floats around out on social media uh, to be uh, rooted anchored in him and then chapter three he says to me son of man eat what's before you eat the scroll it's like jeremiah a uh, difference here jeremiah uh, he takes it in and then it becomes bitter sweet in his mouth bitter in his stomach uh, you don't have that repeated uh right here but he is telling them they're not going to listen to you and that's similar to jeremiah they're they're not going to listen uh you see in verse seven for the end of verse seven chapter three verse seven for the whole house of israel is hardened and obstinate but i will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are i will make your forehead like the heart of stone don't be afraid of them or terrified by them. Uh, one thing, even from back in our days in Kenya, uh, one of the lessons that I learned someone helped bring across is that we, we have to be a tough skinned, but tender hearted. Uh, with the big five in Africa there, the rhino being one of them, you know, rhino hide, it's tough uh, to think of to having a tough hide outwardly uh, but remaining tender-hearted and that's a paradox that's not easy to maintain because generally if somebody's hard on the outside they can be hard on the inside as well uh, but we uh, he's saying i will i will make you hard as stone but from all the indications that we have ezekiel's heart wasn't that way and he'll even say later in 36 
that the Lord is going to give us a new heart. Take out this hardened heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. So tough skin, tender heart. Verse 11, so his audience was those in exile. Go now to your countrymen in exile and speak to them. Where Jeremiah was in Jerusalem speaking to the religious leaders. Uh, Ezekiel is out and speaking uh, to his countrymen in exile. Uh, he arrives there by the river Kibar. Look at the end of verse 15, 315. And there where they were living, I sat among them for seven days overwhelmed. Uh, went and sat seven days, not saying much. So sometimes there's value in just sitting and observing. Uh, you know, two, two ears, one mouth. Theoretically, we would listen twice as much as we speak. Uh, listen more. Uh, James 1, be, what does he say? Be quick to speak and slow to listen. No, it's the other way around. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Uh, Job's friends did well when they came and sat silently for seven days. Their problem started when they opened their mouths and started, started speaking. So here's Ezekiel overwhelmed sitting. Uh, verse 17, I have made you a watchman. And, he, and then he goes on to say, you, you, you are responsible to speak this word to them like at the end of verse 18, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. I've given you a message, and if you keep it to yourself and don't speak, you are accountable. And it's the same principle. Somebody turn over and read Proverbs 24, 11, and 12 for us. Proverbs 24, 11, and 12. Well, you know, of course, if I read it then... Uh, 11 and 12, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, uh huh. Proverbs 24, 11 and 12. Okay, to rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. So, if you say, but we knew nothing about this, but does not he who weighs the, uh, the heart to see it, does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what? So just the principle here, uh, it says, hold back those that are headed down a destructive path. If our response is, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize, Lord, I didn't realize, I didn't know what was happening. It says, doesn't he who knows the heart truly understand? And it's that principle of even uh, not to, not to uh, put and an ungodly fear in us, but there may be some people in our sphere of influence, in your sphere of influence, friends, family members, people in the workplace, whoever, that you have the opportunity to just say something about what Jesus has done, the difference that Jesus has made, or you even just to say, can I pray for you if you're observing something that they're going through? Just very few people will turn down an opportunity. Maybe they don't want to be preached at, but an opportunity to just be prayed for, even if they're not doing it there. I've done that with uh, Muslim and, and Hindu friends, uh, just at least in the beginning, to say, I, I will pray uh, for you. And then as the relationship's grown, I've been able to pray with them uh, on the spot. But uh, we need to just be able to speak of Jesus to people. And he says, hold back those, help those. And we, we it won't you know, it, it won't wash if we just say, oh, I didn't realize, I didn't understand, I didn't know what was happening. Uh, go on through here, uh, chapter four. So Ezekiel has to do a lot of sim, uh, symbolic act, you know, actions. So one is lying on his side. You look at chapter four, verse five. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. Uh, for 390 days, you will bear the sin of the house of Israel. So the northern kingdom, 390 years of rebellion against God. So he lays on his side uh, 390 days on, lay, laying on his left side. And, after, and then verse 6, after you finish, lie down again, well, this time on your right side. Bear the sin of the house of Judah. I've assigned you 40 days, a, a day for each year. 
So, I mean, literally here, Ezekiel has over a year, 390 plus 40, 450 days that he's lying left side or, or right side. Uh, and then he tells him to, you know, take uh, verse 11, measure out a sixth of a hand of water and drink it at set times, eat the food as you, as you would a barley cake, bake it in the sight of the people using human excrement for fuel. Uh, and so you could say, oh, why? You know, that's gross. Why use human excrement? And 13, the Lord said, in this way, the people of Israel will eat defiled food among the nations where I will drive them. But Ezekiel protests. He said, not so, sovereign Lord. And so we see, you know, even though he recognizes God's sovereignty, like Abraham, he's not opposed to dialogue with God. Not so, sovereign Lord. You are sovereign, but no, please not. I've never defiled myself like that. I've never eaten anything dead or torn by wild animals. Verse 15, very well, he said, I will let you bake your bread over cow manure instead of human excrement. Because in the siege, of course, uh, all they were going to be left with was uh, whenever, you know, the destruction and siege of Jerusalem was some, some res resorting, especially in the destruction of the second temple um, to cannibalism and uh, having to use human excrement. So then in chapter five, one of the symbolic things that he does, cutting off his hair, dividing it in a third, into thirds, and he says in chapter five, uh, verse two, when the days of receipt have come to the end, burn a third of the hair with the fire inside the city, take a third and strike it with the sword all around the city and scatter a third to the wind. Uh, and talking about what will happen to the people, some being killed, you know, in the destruction of Jerusalem itself, uh, others scattered outside and then others taken in into captivity. Uh, go on uh, chapter five, verse seven. This is what the sovereign Lord says. You have been more unruly than the nations around you. If I've made this special covenant with you and yet you've been more abominable in, in your ways than even the people around you. Uh, the end of verse seven, you have not even conformed to the standards of the nations around you. you you've gone beyond. Um, chapter, uh, verse nine, chapter five, verse nine, because of all your detestable idols, I will do to you what I have not done before, will never do again. Uh, and he's talking about the severe punishment and the hard times. So that's like what we saw back in Isaiah 28, 21, when God said, this is an alien task, what I'm having to do in punishing you like this. I don't like this. This is a strange and alien task for me. That's the same idea uh, here. Uh, verse in there in verse 11, where he talks about in the middle of verse 11, I'm, I myself will withdraw my favor. Uh, we have this picture in scripture, like Psalm 104, 29, uh, where it talks about when God turns his face aside, creation is terrified. You remember the priestly blessing, number six, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord turn his face towards you and shalom will result. Uh, but so when God's face is, uh, is towards us, there's some shalom and peace. But if God turns his face away, then literally we can say all hell breaks loose. And, uh, and that's what he's saying. I have withdrawn my favor. And it doesn't, God doesn't have, he's not the author of, of destruction. He's not the, he's not the one that comes in and does all of the slaying and killing. God just turns away. And, and like the Psalms, darkness comes in like a flood. Uh, the enemy, the destroyer comes in and wreaks havoc. And that's why we need even a daily prayer of this Lord. Uh, give us what we need today. We, we depend on you today. Just that daily orienting ourselves uh, towards uh, the Son of God, both S-O-N, S-U-N. Go on. We'll go on for a few more minutes and then take a break. Uh, on through. Uh, Uh, if you look at six, just one, one verse in chapter six, uh, verse nine, then the nations where they have been carried captive, those who escape will remember me. 
uh, have been grieved by their adulterous hearts. And part of the reason for the discipline was to turn their hearts back towards God. There they will remember me. Uh, chapter 7. Uh, so all of the first 24 chapters, Ezekiel, you know, is going to be about uh, the judgment. Uh, chapter 7, the end has come. Uh, you look at uh, chapter 7, verses 4, or verse 4. I will not look on you with pity or spare you. I will surely repay you for your conduct and the detestable practices. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Uh, Yahweh, the Lord there, uh, when it appears like that in the small caps, not, not just Adonai, but the Yahweh. Uh, it's like the Exodus 3, God giving his distinctive name, Yahweh. And you will recognize that I'm not just one of the gods, of the Canaanites, of the surrounding nations, of the Egyptians, of the Babylonians, that I am who I am. I am Yahweh. Uh, and then also you kind of see the principle of Galatians 6 and verse 7 there. Uh, don't be deceived. Whatever you sow is what you're going to reap. And so he, he says, because of your disobedience. Uh, 710, the day is here, it has come, doom has burst forth, the rod has budded, arrogance has blossomed. It's like evil, evil has flourished. Keep going uh, on through seven. Uh, you see uh, in verse 22 again, I will turn my face away from them. That picture, that principle of God's face being turned towards or, or away. Uh, the end of chapter seven. In their last few lines, by their own standards, I will judge them. Then they will know that I am the Lord. And I forget how many times they will know that I am the Lord. I think, uh, I don't want to say I heard it, but I heard several different numbers in going through this uh, many times here in, in Ezekiel. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Judged by their own standards, kind of the principle of Luke 6. Don't judge, so you won't be judged for whatever measure you use is the measure that will be used against you. Uh, so chapter 8 through 11 is God's presence departing from the temple. Did you have, Did you? were you going to say something, Ed? I was, but I was going to wait for you to finish. Oh, I must have threw my hand. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm just going to put it it's interesting to me is um, with the, the concept that uh, God doesn't, it's not like he's taken these Babylonians and made them into this 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 group that he's going to turn against. Like you said, he just turned away. Yeah. Because he turned away from him first. And he's just going to let this happen. In other words, he's going to let these sinners sin. Yeah, but they're going to get theirs right. you know, in the end too, and so I always, I always like to go back to two chronicles. For, 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 if my people who are called by my name will seek my face, yeah, and pray, so I always think you know just turn back to me, you know, and you know, just, yeah, you know, I, I I didn't raise this group of people that I was automatically going to send upon you. These are sinners. Yeah. Right. From the get, you know, I, just, I just turn my face and let them sing. Yeah. Very, very, very Yeah, and Ed just making the note that it's not that God makes like the Babylonians the way that they are. You know, they, they've made their own choices. Uh, he allows them as his rod of discipline. And then, as you said, and uh, Habakkuk will deal with this. Lord, how can you be using these Babylonians, the wicked people? Uh and uh, the, the Lord says, and I will punish them because they went too far, you know, ruthlessness, no mercy. Yes, Judah. You say his presence was departing. Yeah. And you see it in, uh, it's contained as a section eight through 10, okay. especially 10 is where the glory departs. Eight uh, tells us about all of the idolatry taking place in the temple. Uh, and you look, you in the spirit, 
we look at verse the middle of verse three, chapter eight, verse three, the spirit lifted me up between heaven and earth. And it's interesting here is this at the well, three, he, verse three, the, the picture of him snatching him up by his hair. I, I suspect it wasn't as uncomfortable to Ezekiel as it sounds to us, but he says, uh, look like a hand and took me by the hair of my head. The spirit lifted me between earth and heaven and a vision and God took me to Jerusalem. So, you know, did he go or was it in a vision? Well, you know, leave that to God. He says he, he saw this. It's kind of like Paul saying, was I, was I there when I viewed that? Or, you know, was it just in a vision? He says, I don't know. Uh, humanly, I think it becomes impossible to, to sort out what happens whenever we enter more into God's realm. He took me to Jerusalem and where the idol that prov uh, provokes jealousy stood. There before me, there's the glory of God of Israel. So the glory of God there, but we'll see it depart later. And so all of these uh, there in verse six, he talks about, you drive me far from my own sanctuary. The elders of the people offering sacrifices to other idols in these rooms uh, around the temple. Uh, uh, and they're saying they're, they're doing these things in verses 12, doing them in darkness. The Lord doesn't see us. He's forsaken the land. The women uh, in 14 mourning for Tammuz and Tammuz was one of the gods, a lover of Venus. And so they were worshiping and mourning uh, uh, Tammuz. And then you look so this is kind of going around the temple. So it's bad enough he's saying that the elders are doing this. The women are here worshiping Tammuz. 16, he brought me to the inner court of the house of the Lord. And there at the entrance of the temple between the portico and the altar were about 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east. And they were bowing down to the sun of the east. So it moves on into the center of the temple. It's not just all this pollution out there right in the core uh these men turned with their backs turned to the temple of god bowing to the east worshiping the the god uh that the egyptians and others worship and of course it doesn't take us long to see that to turn your back on someone is just a kind of an ultimate sign of disrespect somebody walks in the door and if you do this oh my goodness you know the the message is pretty clear and here they were turning and we saw that same picture in isaiah turning their backs on god saying stop confronting us with the holy one of israel uh talked in the end of 17 about putting the branch to their nose well that's just uh obviously cultural but it was a way of showing disrespect uh so the idolaters killed chapter 9 it's the using the Babylonians in 586 uh, and uh, to, to punish those. You look in verse five, he talks about slaughter, old men, young men, maidens, women, children, verse six. And so he's seeing this in the vision, all of them being slain. Ezekiel's response wasn't one of jubilation. Even though all of this wickedness were going, was going on, look at, look at, Ezekiel's response in chapter 9, verse 6. Slaughter old man, uh, where was it? I'm sorry. 8, verse 8. While they were killing and I was left alone, I fell face down crying out, Oh, sovereign Lord, are you going to destroy the entire remnant of Israel in this outpouring of your wrath? And so Ezekiel's was, his heart was, you know, was torn by this, even though it was all wickedness. One lesson to us is if we truly have the heart of God, we will never delight in the death of people, not even the death of the wicked. And we'll see that later in, in chapter 16, chapter 18. As people of God, we should never rejoice at the death of someone, even the death of a wicked person. But we'll, we'll get to that uh, later. So, and we'll stop after this one and take a, a short break. But verse 10, I'm sorry, chapter 10, chapter 10, the glory departs from the temple. So it departs here in chapter 10 and near the end of the book in 43, we see it returning, but it's not just the same old temple in Jerusalem. It's more uh, into the future. Uh, it's beginning to look more than, you know, messianic age of the spirit of God returning. 
but here uh, departs the chapter two, the Lord said to the man clothed in linen, and go in among the wheels beneath the cherubim. So the cherubim, the altar was on this and these wheels that turned every which way, which are very unusual for the time. Chariot axles were fixed axles. So a very big turning radius. Uh, one teacher talking about this said, unlike your shopping carts and grocery stores where the wheels don't work well, these wheels work very well and they spin on the spot, turn on a dime. Uh, verse four, chapter 10, verse four, the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim. Uh, the cloud filled the temple and verse four, the court was full of the radiance of the glory, the Shekinah of the glory of God. Uh, and you go all the way through, look at verse 18, chapter 10, verse 18. Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. Uh, so the, the glory had departed. You remember back in uh, 1 Samuel 4, uh, where Eli, you know, was as a, you know, as one of the last of the judges and a prophet was did not, didn't honor God. He didn't discipline Hophni and Phinehas' sons. And they were killed by the, the Philistines. And uh, Eli's daughter-in-law gave birth at that time and hearing that Eli was killed and Hophni and Phinehas were killed. And uh, she named the child what? Ichabod. Ichabod, meaning the glory hath departed. Mm -hmm. And so here, you know, the glory departs from the temple of, of the Lord. So it'll bring us to chapter 11. Uh, so let's just take a, a short break, stretch. I know y'all at home can get up and go. Um, uh, of course, you can move around. You may already be moving around anyway. Uh, but we'll just take five minutes or so uh, and then come on back and we'll keep uh, working through this. I'm not going to stop this uh, uh, just because. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to try to even pause the recording. Uh, we we'll just leave it going. So, all right, let's take a break. Is um, Kirk, Brett, Kirkby and Fitzgerald? Yeah. Sure yeah, get a little bit of something. Sorry, you sense. have to walk under this head. Um, you know, one thing I could do is leave. There you go. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. good. Right. Do you guys have a food pantry? Yeah, we do. Um, we used to have like an active food pantry. So what we do then is if somebody needs food, they just give us a list. Yeah, we do. Oh, we well, do I, I have this. Uh, uh, my seniors, they're closed now, but they, they bring us a box of food once a week. And I can't. As a matter of fact, I don't. And it's mostly like it's, it's, it's canned food, like types of tuna and stuff like that. And I was wondering if that's something you could eat. Oh, yeah. If you, if you donate it to us, we'll give it out. Okay. I, I, I bought it. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. But I haven't taken much out of it. And most of it comes directly from the food bank. And it's too big a risk. Uh, so I, I brought the boxes in the car. Okay. So I'll take it and we'll give it out. Okay. Yeah. I'll be sure. Because we supply it to part of. Food yeah, I figured some yeah. kind of way because it's just been sitting. I used to give it to this guy, but I can't. I lost touch with him, and even he couldn't take all of it because they bring us the box every month. Yeah, well, we'll put it to good use. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kurt, so how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Let me close that out. I just double checking it. Yeah, we've been. This out to one more closer here. Your wife back to school? Uh, she is, yeah. Uh -huh. She went back right away uh -huh. uh, in August and uh, has been uh, on campus ever since. And uh, you know, they keep the distance, and uh, you know, she is all, you know, they have all their protocols in place, and she's done okay. Is she still a nurse or is she in the classroom? No, she's in the classroom, but uh, yeah. <laughs> speech, speech pathologist. Yeah. yeah, so does all of the speech therapy there. Uh, 
Yeah, she'll probably make a change. I'll need to make a change at the end of this year to go back to contract because she can only do five years. Uh, she has all these other years where she paid into Social Security uh -huh. and not she wasn't doing te Texas teacher retirement. Oh, okay. If she stays beyond five years, she loses everything in Social Security and she only has the few years of PRS. Oh. I like somebody who spent 20 or 30 years right. putting in the TRS. Uh, so it, 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 you don't even have a choice. You can't say, no, I want to keep Social Security. It's just automatic. If you're still in either going to your but fifth. She, she can't start taking her Social Security? Uh, well, if she stayed too long at the, the school district, she would lose the 20 plus years that she's paid into Social Security, and it would be only what she's got in TRS. So she has to stop being a district employee and then she can go back to contract. Mm -hmm. She will uh, work with the contractor and they will send her into the schools. So she'll keep working in the schools, but on a contract basis mm -hmm. instead of a district employee. But yeah, the boys are back. Mm -hmm. uh, ben and Ryan and their families are back in Malawi. How about uh, the one that got married? He's good. They're over in Sugarland. Oh, okay. Yeah, they live over there. Oh, okay. And uh, and so uh, Amy still works with uh, the Catholic Family Services. Doing, she works with a team of lawyers uh, that are advocates for juvenile asylum seekers. Oh. And uh, then uh, Ty's looking right now. He's going to make a change from teaching and. And so he's, he's looking, but doing well. We enjoy them being relatively close by. Yeah. So we see them every couple yeah. of weeks or so. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. All your Christmas time was, went, went well, your Christmas. And I just have one child here and uh, uh, I have one in uh, Lafayette, one in Florida, and one in uh, Greenville, Greenfield, Massachusetts. So, oh. so I go once in a while to see the one that's here, and the one in Lafayette. She comes to visit. Um, let's see, for Christmas she didn't come to visit. Why didn't she come to visit? I forget. But anyway, she's coming in February. Oh, okay. So she tried. I also try to go over there to see her. Yeah. And uh, you just drive over but there. Right, yeah, but right now, yeah, because of the pandemic, I haven't, I haven't been there since September. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know we haven't been to my mother and dad's uh, in over a year. That's the oh, first time. Oh. Now we've seen them at at Ty's wedding, and then at Susan's mom's funeral. Mm -hmm. Saw them, but we haven't been back yeah. out home yeah. where I grew up. But yeah, I know. So you have one then east, further east. You yeah, said Greenfield. Greenfield, where? Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So how often do you see him? Oh, I, I, <laughs> I saw him last year and I told him I'm not coming again when is it in the fall. It was too cold for me. No. It was too cold. I said, I'm going to come in the summer. Well, the pandemic, I was going the summer past. But the pandemic came along, so I didn't know. Right. Yeah, so I talked to him a lot. Oh, okay. I talked to all of my kids. So is it two girls and a son? Two girls, two boys. Okay. Oh, the boys are twins. You're a fool? Uh -huh, the boys are twins, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Where is the other son then? Florida. Oh, okay. So yeah, Massachusetts, Florida, to Texas, and, and Louisiana. Yeah. Yeah, so we did do a Zoom. I don't particularly like it, though. Yeah. <laughs> but we did a Zoom and uh, got other folks involved, other relatives involved in that. Yeah. So right now, I had my first vaccine, so the others are just trying right now to get there. Oh. No. They can't because they're not in 1A or 1B. Right. Yeah. But they're trying to um, get on the waiver. Did you get both? Just one? Just 
Oh, well, I get my second one in February. Oh, okay. February oh, okay. 10th. So, this um, COVID thing, when is it, is it going to end this year? Or? COVID 10. COVID, COVID 10. COVID 19. Oh, yeah. Oh, and we don't can, know. <laughs> Yeah. When is life going to come back to normal? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> uh, probably will be a a different normal. You think so? Uh, yeah, I'm sure some things will look different than they did before. Even for us, I mean, of course, uh, I don't I don't think streaming is is going to change now. All, it opens the door to people from other places yeah. studying with oh, us, from other and then oh, okay. and then there'll be okay, some that maybe didn't come because like we have one from Katie, but we we don't usually ever have anybody from Katie just because it's so far. So uh, I think you know that change is probably here to stay. And hopefully later people will feel better about you know coming back together in the classroom and. I, I hope so anyway. So what about um, um, the mega churches? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what it's going to mean for some of them. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it impacts budget and all well if i guess if we're okay we'll go ahead and resume i'm going to go ahead and start with a video the bible project read scripture video on uh, the first part of ezekiel keep checking here we're good Um, all right, we're still sharing. So folks, we're going to go ahead and I think we'll have sound and everything here. Yeah, pick up handouts for, and so <clears throat> I should say for all of you online here, uh, if you want a hard copy, I think like I know uh, Marisol and Antonia uh, I've always sent one out. If you want a hard copy instead of uh, the email attachment, uh, I'll be glad to do that. And so just let me know, text me or email me uh, if you want us to mail, mail out a hard copy to you of, of the lessons. All right, we'll go ahead with the video. Oh. Let me come about it in a different way here. The book of the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel okay. was a priest who had been living in Jerusalem during the first Babylonian attack on the city. And they spared the city, but they took a first wave of Israelite prisoners and hauled them off into exile, and Ezekiel was among them. So the book begins five years after all that, and Ezekiel is sitting on the bank of an irrigation canal near his Israelite refugee camp, and it's his 30th birthday, no less, the year that he would have been installed as a priest in Jerusalem. And then all of a sudden, Ezekiel has this vision. He sees a storm cloud approaching, and then inside the cloud are four strange creatures that have wings outstretched and touching each other. And these creatures each had four faces. And then he saw four wheels, one by each creature. And then he saw that the wings of the creatures were supporting this dazzling platform. And then on that platform is a throne. And then sitting on that throne is this human-like creature glowing and shrouded in fire. And then all of a sudden Ezekiel realizes 
is what he's seeing. He calls it the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. It's God riding his royal throne chariot. Now the word glory, in Hebrew it's kavod, it means heavy or significant. The biblical authors use this word to describe the physical appearance and manifestation of God's significance when he shows up in person. These images in the vision, they're very similar to what happened when God appeared on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. And it's also very similar to the depictions of God's presence over the Ark of the Covenant. And that's actually the most shocking thing about Ezekiel's vision. What is God's glory doing in Babylon? It's supposed to be above the Ark of the Covenant in the temple in Jerusalem. And so the first section of the book opens to explore that question as Ezekiel begins to accuse Israel of rebellion. So God first speaks to Ezekiel from the throne chariot and he commissions him as a prophet. Ezekiel is to accuse Israel of breaking their covenant agreement with God in a couple ways. Israel has given their allegiance to other gods and has been worshiping idols and this has all led to rampant social injustice and violence. And so as a result, God appoints Ezekiel to warn the people. The first Babylonian attack that took Ezekiel into exile is going to be matched by another. And Jerusalem, its temple, all face imminent destruction. So Ezekiel uses words and more to get his message across. He also performs sign acts. These were a form of street theater. Ezekiel would go out in public and start behaving in these really bizarre ways that were like parables of his prophetic message. So he was supposed to build a tiny model of Jerusalem and then stage an attack on it. Or he was to shave off all of his hair and then chop it up with a sword. Or the most extreme, he was to play the role of the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. And he would lay on his side for over a year eating food cooked over poop as a sign of the nasty food that people will have to eat during the siege of Jerusalem. And perhaps the most disheartening thing of all is the bad news God gave Ezekiel that no one was going to listen to him. Israel would reject him because of their rebellious and hard heart. And this recalls Moses' description of the people after the wilderness rebellions, when he predicted that exile would one day happen. And Ezekiel had the unfortunate privilege of seeing it all come to pass. And so a dismayed Ezekiel, he begins to perform his task. And after about a year, he has another vision. This one is about the temple. He goes on this virtual tour of the temple and he sees what's happening there in his absence and it is not good. In the outer courtyard in front of the temple, he sees this large idol statue. And then he sees the elders of Israel worshiping other gods, both outside and inside the temple. And then he sees the women of Israel. They're worshiping a Babylonian god named Tammuz. And the vision ends with God's glorious throne chariot moving up and away from the temple. It's leaving, going east, headed towards Babylon. And so in chapter 11, we come to see why and how God's glory appeared to Ezekiel there in Babylon. Israel's idolatry and their covenant violations, it's become so blatant and offensive that God has left his temple. They've driven him away and he consigns it to destruction. But God hasn't abandoned his people. Rather, he goes into exile with them. And so at the end of this vision in chapter 11, God promises that he will return a remnant of Israel back to the land and he'll transform them by removing their heart of stone and giving them a new soft heart of flesh so that they can love and truly follow their God after all. This is a small glimmer of hope and it's quickly submerged under the reality of the imminent destruction. But chapter 11, it's a key transition and it helps us understand how the rest of the book has been designed. So the next three sections are all announcements of God's judgment, first on Israel, then on the nations around Israel, and then on Jerusalem itself. But then after that, the hopeful conclusion of chapter 11 gets developed in the final three sections of the book. First hope for Israel, then for the nations, and then for all creation. Chapters 12 through 24 focus on God's judgment coming to Israel. And this is a diverse collection of poems and essays. And here Ezekiel shows his fondness for parable and allegory. So he depicts Israel as a burnt, useless stick or as a rebellious wife, or as a dangerous raging lion that gets captured, or as two promiscuous sisters. These are all depictions of Israel's senseless rebellion and idolatry that results in their ruin. 
In this section, Ezekiel also acts like a lawyer. He begins arguing the case that, first of all, Jerusalem's destruction is truly deserved after centuries of covenant violation, and that even if the most righteous people in the world, like Noah or Daniel or Job, were alive and praying for God to spare Israel, God would not accept their prayers. It's far too late. And so God's goodness actually demands that he bring justice on this generation of Israel. The exile has become inevitable. They've reached the point of no return. Following this, Ezekiel focuses first on the nations immediately around Israel, and then on the two most powerful states in the region, Egypt and then Tyre. Israel has allied with these nations and adopted their... All right, even though there's not much left, just a minute or so, <clears throat> There, we won't be going into chapters 25 and following today, the judgment on the nations. So I'm just going to uh, stop it there because uh, we are going to be in the sections uh, previous to this, the judgment uh, on Israel. And I'll continue to leave, let's see, um, as we, when we get on down here, I can just give you a, a different screen to look at. This will be more of the message, more of the message of hope that will uh, come up later. Um, as he said in the, the later, the latter chapters, 30, what is it, 34 to the end, uh, where there's more of a message of hope, but we'll leave that up. So turn in your Bibles back to Ezekiel 11. We just finished chapter 10. The glory departed. And so 11 uh, talks about, you know, why all of that is happening, judgment on Judah because of their idolatry. Um, 11 verse 5, the Spirit of the Lord came to me and told me to say, this is what the Lord says, O house of Israel. But I know what is going through your mind, uh, continuing to kill the people of God, the prophets. So there was persecution of the faithful, which, you know, is happening with our brothers and sisters around the world. And of course, could even come here to uh, to us more in America. Uh, Eleven, verse seven. This is what the Lord says. Uh, go on to verse eight. Sorry, you you fear the sword, and the sword is what I will bring against you. You remember with Jeremiah, the people would not listen about going out to the Babylonian army. He said, "No, no, we're going to run for it. Go to e Egypt." And the Lord said, "The sword will." pursue you into Egypt. Um, so when we're disobedient to God, the very things that we fear or despise are, are generally what we encounter uh, in our in our lives <clears throat> when we're when we are, you know, in the Lord and in our contemporary uh, terms in Christ, then regardless of the turmoil happening around us, we can have peace the shalom of God, the peace of God in, in our hearts, even with the turmoil. Yes. Uh, I'm just saying it really makes it uh, even better to repent. You know, like, like John the Baptist, uh, his ministry was you know, repent. Yeah. Which is really such a cheap op op option and a very affordable option. Yeah. And really free. I'm saying cheap, but it's really free. <laughs> you know, the second yeah. God is, you know, say, Lord, I'm sorry. And it is. And that's probably the secret in understanding that God is so merciful that regardless of where you are, if you just say, well, listen, I'm going to come back. Yeah. Even, even in that situation, God is so merciful and he will just take you back like nothing ever happened. Yeah. Yeah, that's Good point, just uh, Ignatius, you know, reminding us that uh, what God, God calls us to is it's not difficult, it doesn't cost us, and it's repentance. John the Baptist's message, Jesus' message uh, to 
to turn back to him. And it is noteworthy that even when you talk about the Greek word there for repentance, metanoia, uh, it, is, it is more than just stop doing bad things and just start doing good things. It is a, it is a, a turning of the mind. Yeah, the, the, word, the, the, the word metanoia literally means, you know, to, to change our minds, to change our mindset. It's, it would be in the, in the spirit of what Paul says in Romans 12, be transformed, don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And uh, so he calls us to, uh, you know, to just an, an outward superficial obedience to just outward acts of religion to a deep heartfelt relationship uh, with God. Uh, this reminds me, it popped into my mind during the video, and so I'm afraid if I don't say it here. Uh, ah, it was about some of the work. Oh, hopefully it'll come back uh, for those of you there. Um, well, well, had it just momentarily and then it evaporated. Uh, I pray it'll come back. And then of course I can always communicate uh, by, by text or email and for future sake uh, notice, I will always try to turn off group text when I send it so that if you reply, you're replying to, to just me. Uh, uh yeah well i pray that that will come back and i'll think about it later but yeah thank you for that reflection uh ignatius because uh that is a uh him calling us back to himself through repentance is what a gift it is uh there's that conforming in chapter 11 verse 12 you will know that i'm the lord for you have not followed my decrees or kept my laws but have conformed to the standards of the nations around you and uh, Moses had told the people of Israel, like in Deuteronomy 6 and Exodus 23, don't act like the people around you. And Paul gives a New Testament equivalent there in Romans 12. Uh, in light of this, you know, this great mercy of God, uh, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices and don't be conformed you know, put into the mold or pressured by the world around us, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's kind of a metanoia there, the renewing uh, of your mind. So you go on to 11, and that's the first uh, glimmer of hope, as, as Tim Mackey said in the video, 1118. They will return to it and remove all its vile images to the, to the temple. And, and they do this to some degree uh, under Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah 19, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and will be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. So that's significant highlight. Uh, if you have, you know, depending on what Bible you've got there, but 11, 11, 19, uh, it's repeated in 36 26 and 27 and it's it's what we saw in jeremiah 31 31 through 33 so there's only about three places here twice in ezekiel once in jeremiah that we see this language right here taking out a heart of stone and giving a heart of flesh and they will follow and ezekiel 36 adds i will put my spirit in them and then they will follow my ways. And so that's the gift that we have, the gift of the Holy Spirit that helps us, uh, helps us to walk in God's ways. Uh, and then he uses that covenant language there at the end of 20. They will be my people and I will be their God. So God did that covenant with Israel back at Sinai. Uh, and they have broken that covenant. And now he's talking about establishing a new covenant. With them. And so what do you hear Jesus saying in Matthew 26, 26, uh, at the Passover meal, he takes the third cup of the meal and says, this is the blood of the new covenant that, that I am making with you. So 12, uh, Mackie talked about uh, how uh, that the 
you know, what that I can do. It's good to have that Isaiah passage, but I can, let me put up something here, the poster uh, that will be uh, just a little bit more helpful uh, because it will give us, so Ezekiel, on you can do it uh judgment we're in 12 so on oh i can't expand that way that's so uh this should be then what you're seeing from from the poster the section that we're in 12 through 24 uh, so he uses, uh, in 12, he symbolizes the, the exile. Uh, this is common language that even Jesus picks up and uses. Look at 12, 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, you are living among a rebellious people. They have eyes to see, but do not see, and ears to hear, but do not hear, for they are a rebellious people. And Jesus uh, quotes that in Mark 7 six and seven, uh, same thing as in Isaiah 29, 13, uh, eyes to see. So we need to, we need to hear that and always be aware because we can think we see and understand. Uh, and if we begin to treat relationship with God as just religion, as formal, you know, ritual acts of worship that we go to, then we are in maybe in that very process when we treat it as just outward acts, you know, worship, tithe, uh, give, maybe take the Lord's Supper and do these things. If we reduce it to that, then we've already begun to be blinded some. We have eyes, but we're not truly seeing. We have ears. We may be hearing a message, but we're not truly hearing and understanding. And so with Jesus quoting that, we need to understand how you know, how much of a, a risk or a danger that is for us to do that, uh, to, to see and hear, but not truly understand. Uh, so he symbolizes the exile digging through uh, the, the wall. You look at um, uh, 12, the end, chapter 12, the end of verse 11, and as I have done, so it will be done to them. They will go into exile as captives. The prince among them, Zedekiah, vassal king, puppet king, will, will go out, you know, as an exile. Uh, and we saw how weak he was with Jeremiah, always listening to his advisors. Uh, but look at 1221. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, what is the proverb you have in the land of Israel? The days go by and every vision comes to nothing. Uh, and then say to them. So there, you know, basically the people are saying, ah, you know, yada, 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 Ezekiel, uh, all of this about visions and nothing happens or with Jeremiah, you know, they mocked him. Uh, and the Lord is saying, it won't, and that's similar to what we see in Second Peter 3, 3 and 4, that some say, well, you know, here Jesus has gone and yet nothing changes. You know, he's not returned. Uh, the Lord always keeps his word. It's just that his timetable is not ours. And, uh, and so he's saying uh, these visions will come to pass. And it was within five years that they did. 13, the false prophets uh, condemned. Look at 13, verse 3. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Uh, we need to understand that even today, as we alluded to earlier, uh, we need to have our ears open, you know, be, be wide awake, be alert. There are people who mislead. There are wolves in sheepskin. There are false teachers. So we, uh, Peter, James, uh, even Paul using the language of be sober, be alert. Uh, we, we have to, we cannot just believe everything that we hear out there in the name of the Lord. 
or even what we hear, because this says that who listens to the Holy Spirit. In other words, it may look like the Holy Spirit of God, but it's not. Yeah. It's just, you know. Right. Spirit. That we can, we need to discern because we can be duped by appearances. Uh, Paul saying in Second Corinthians eleven that uh, don't be deceived. Uh, Satan, you know, can masquerade as an angel of light. Therefore, his servants can masquerade as servants of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, it really takes discernment on our part. And not and not just always you know me 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 by myself it's together with other people of god uh wise and understanding people you know what do you make of what's happening that we like proverbs 15 there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors yes we want to study the word but none of us are you know me nobody is in, equipped with enough knowledge and discernment on our own God has intended it that we're part of a body, right. that we need one another in order to stand strong and detect so deceptions. It will, it will take a lot of humility from, our, from us to yeah. realize that we are not it. Right. True. Ignatius saying it takes humility on our parts to, to realize I can't do it by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some people, the, the adage that over the last more, more than a decade, uh, Jesus, yes. Church, no. Well, you, 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 you can't have that. The church is the body of Christ. Yeah. As flawed, as flawed as she yeah. may be at times, yeah. the church is the body of Christ. You can't sever the head from the body. So, they're, they're, we don't. We can't be a lone ranger out there by ourselves. Uh, we will be taken down. Yeah, as wise as we think we might be, uh, but we know the danger of being wise in our own eyes. Uh, so the the false prophets condemned in there in 13. Uh, look at 17. We've seen some of this before, but verse 17, chapter 13, verse 17. Now, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people who prophesy out of their own imagination. So men, women alike, this, the daughters of your people prophesying from their own imagination. So that can happen. We just because someone says the spirit told me mm -hmm. we need to we need to know better than to just believe it because someone says that John in first John four test every spirit to see whether it's of the Lord. We you, you we we cannot go by the spirit. Yeah, and not only that, you know, we are all priests under the new covenant. Yeah. So God can speak to you. Right. If it's that important, God will speak to you. Yeah. You, you know, you don't need to have somebody else tell you, you are a child of God, so he can speak to you. We're a nation of priests, and yeah. Ignatius saying as fellow priests yeah. that we don't have, it's not just senior pastors or someone with a prophetic title or role that uh that we would be able to see the lord corroborate a truth with in other believers uh and not just just what we uh, get that off uh you know you may see it or hear from one person uh verse 20 13 verse 20 i'm against your magic charms things that they were using using uh 22 what false people do false teachers you dishearten the righteous with your lies uh, and you encourage the wicked not to turn from their evil ways. And that's that's the result of a false, false teaching. So on to 14, idolaters condemned. Uh, this is what we saw back in the temple in chapter nine. Uh, Verse 1, 14, 1, some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat down in front of me. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts and put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I let them inquire of me at all? Uh, therefore, speak to them. This is what the Lord says. When any Israelite sets up an idol in his heart, uh, you're going down. I, the Lord, will answer him 
answer him myself in keeping with his idolatry. Five, verse five, I will do this to recapture the hearts of the people of Israel. So that is significant where he is, the Lord is saying to Ezekiel, these men come, you know, look everything outwardly, maybe looks okay. They don't have any idols they brought with them. They don't have the charms around their neck. But he says they set up idols in their heart. Mm -hmm. And of course, that would be the danger for us uh, today since, uh, since generally we don't have these uh, some sleek idols that we go to bow to. Now, we've always said, though, that, of course, technology and idol for us can be technology, you know, our, our phones or other things, but things in our heart. We can set up idols in our hearts. And the Lord's, and, and look at what he says, my purpose is what? Not to decimate them, not to destroy them. I want to recapture their hearts. And so here that's significant in the Old Testament where we can, we can fall prey to this false image of God that he's a God of wrath in the Old Testament. No, he's showing us his heart. And we said that's one of the benefits of the prophets. It helps us to see the heart of God. He says, one of my purposes is to recapture the hearts of people, people that have strayed from me. And we need to remember that because we can look at disobedient. Of course, if we have some humility about ourselves, like you talked about, Ignatius, we will realize, well, even if I'm not hell-bent on rebellion right now, I have been disobedient to the Lord in my life. So where we have that, that first beatitude, Matthew 5, 3 mindset, blessed are the poor in heart, the poor in spirit, for they, uh, will, get in, they will enter the kingdom of God when we recognize, yeah, that's me, but for the grace of God, there go I. So a constant humility on our part. But when we see people who are obviously disobedient, whatever party we may be like to affiliate ourselves with, think one's better than the other. If we look at, quote, the enemy out there, we need to understand where we would like to maybe see retribution or see them get their just desserts. The heart of God is what he says here. I want to recapture their hearts. Yeah. But you know, he doesn't do date rape, so he doesn't force himself on them. And it requires them to willingly uh, come back to God, to turn back to him and embrace him. But that's just so significant there in 14.5. I do it to recapture their hearts, guard against idols that we might set up in our hearts. And, and make sure that idol is not one even of our own interpretation of scripture, we can be, we, we can, you know, uh, we can make the mistake of thinking, uh, you know, we'd never say it because we wouldn't want to hear ourselves say that, but we can act as if, yeah, I've, I've got it. I mean, I understand, you know, how to, uh, to read scripture, to interpret it maybe better than, than other people, you know, even that can become an idol mm -hmm. if we're, if we're elevating our own understanding or interpretation, it's always a posture of humility. Yeah, lest he falls there from Corinthians. Yes, be careful thinking you stand so that you, in case, so you don't fall. Uh, 14, the judgment is, is inescapable. Look at 14, 14. <laughs> Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, uh, were in it in the city, they could only save themselves by their righteousness, declares the Lord. Uh, in Jeremiah 15, we saw it. Jer it was there in Jeremiah 15, 1. It was Moses and Samuel. Uh, here, Noah, Daniel, and Job. Uh, he's saying, no, it's too late for the city. I will. I've got to tear down so I can rebuild. I've got to punish. I've got to purify it. So he could go on with, with his purposes. But again, it was always for restoration. And then he repeats down in verse 20 again, Noah, Daniel, and Job. Uh, 21, he speaks of his four dreadful judgments. Um, sword, famine, wild beast, and plague. Uh, 
so 15 is one of the allegories on judgment, uh, the burnt useless stick that you, you see on the, on the poster. So that's one allegory. That is what Jerusalem is like after 586 BC is a burnt and useless stick. Uh, instead of in verse seven, 15, seven, instead of his face being turned towards them, we see in, in verse seven, I have turned my face, set my face against them. 16, uh, the allegory of a, of a rebellious wife, an unfaithful wife, uh, confront Jerusalem. She, you know, they have been unfaithful because it, it's a covenant they've made with God. And, and it's a mar like he, he uses terms of it being a marriage covenant with Israel. So they are, they are his wife, but they've been an unfaithful wife. But it's pretty significant. Uh, he's basically saying to Israel, you think it's because you were such so good, powerful nation that I was drawn to you. Uh, he says, no, not at all. Uh, like at the end of verse five, he's saying, it's like you were a newborn abandoned in a field. You were thrown out into the open field. So look at 16.6. This is a good thing to keep in mind for all of us, 16.6. Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood as you lay there in your blood. I said to you, live, and I made you grow. Uh, and you grew up and developed and became the most beautiful of jewels. Uh, and so that's where he says, Re remember our origins. We all need to remember our origins. And maybe we came from a good family from, and you know, we were brought up in, uh, you know, in the church or as, you know, some would say, you know, uh, I had a drug problem growing up. My parents would drug me to church three times a week or whatever, you know, we may have, grown up uh, thinking, you know, never really entering a rebellious stage, but still we need to understand, you know, that apart from the grace of God, yeah. our, our good deeds, our righteousness is like a filthy rag. Yeah. And, and so he's saying to Israel, you, you think it was because you were this attractive people that I was drawn to you. You were like a newborn abandoned by the road wallowing in your afterbirth and I came and I took you and cleaned you. I cared for you, groomed you and you grew and became beautiful. And, and so it is in that sense that they became attractive. And so even with us always realizing again, that's the spirit of Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who recognize you are a spiritual beggar. We are, are spiritually broken without Christ. No matter our church background, no matter our family pedigree, the playing field is level. Yeah. At and any stage, really, of What? At any stage. At any stage. when we're saved. But right. Throughout. Throughout, until we're seen. Yeah. No, Ignatius making a good point. It's uh, the place for humility is not just when we, how we came into Christ and which, you know, Romans, uh, Romans 5, that he loved us while we were still sinners, but that we have that awareness of ourselves all through life. We grow, we've been in the Lord for 20 or 30 years. We still, and and it is, I, I'm thankful that uh, in some of it comes from my own failures, but that that awareness of, but for the grace of God is constantly with me. I I have other problems, uh, but generally one of them is not that of, of thinking that uh, I'm all that and a bag of chips too, you know, that I'm really, that I'm something. I, and I, I, I still, I know, and that's not saying I don't have uh, other, other issues, but it's just been drilled into me. And what you see in Peter and James, God opposes the proud. Well, that's enough, you know, to scare it out of me you want you know life's hard enough as it is yep. do you want god opposed to you do you want him to have to be against you uh forbid you know that that would be the case 
uh, so you see, uh, look, oh, look at, uh, he develops the, this analogy of, uh, or allegory of Israel growing up as a beautiful bride uh, in verse uh, eight, I spread my garment over you, which is, you know, there of becoming united in marriage, you know, and, and even in the, in the act of sex, I gave you solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you. You became mine, marriage. Nine, I bathed you with water, put bracelets on you. Gold and silver gave David and Solomon wealth. Uh, look at the end of verse 13. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen under, and especially again, under the heyday of David and Solomon, the golden age. 14, and your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty because of the splendor I had given you made your beauty perfect. And he keeps saying, it was, there was nothing that you had that was not a gift. I gave it to you. I gave it all to you. But they got drunk on their, on their own beauty, power, wealth. But 15, you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. And how? How did Israel, how did they commit prosti you know, prostitution, adultery? Alliances with Babylon. They liked their flowing, you know, their, their, their military gear. They liked the Egyptians with all of their might and power. So they made these alliances, got in bed with these other lovers. Uh, all the 17, you took the fine jewelry I gave you, the gold, the silver, made for yourselves idols. So again, look at our own lives. Okay, we, we hear a lot there about what Israel and Judah did, but how, you know, to what degree, how can we begin to slip into that in our lives? There's nothing that we have that the Lord did not give us, you know, everything. And so, you know, one way is that we could think, well, okay, I'll give him 10%, you know, 90's mine, 10%'s his. Well, no, the truth is 100% of it is his. And he's such a generous God that he says, sure, I understand. Take and use what you need to for yourself, for family. You know, just honor me, give, give back to me. And of course, it's not limited to just 10%, not like we can't give more in, in other ways. But we need, to, we need to make sure that we don't view things that God has given us as ours, mine, be careful about the possessives that we use uh that it really is the lord's uh everything you get an inheritance from somebody well it's still from the lord uh and he wants to see you honor him in the way that you use it um so that's the 16 is largely about that keep moving through it it's a long one very uh in verse 25, he talks about you kept offering your body with increasing promiscuity. Uh, you became more lewd than those around you. Uh, set 27, so I reduced your territory and gave some to Philistines. 28, you engaged in prostitution with the Assyrians because you were insatiable and you still were not satisfied. 30, how weak-willed you are. Uh, at the end of 30, acting like a brazen prostitute. Uh, 32, you adulterous wife. So the Lord just comes out and says, you know, to, to Judah, Jerusalem there, you adulterous wife. 35, therefore you prostitute. Uh, well, back in 33, sorry, it's 32, you're, you adulterous wife. 33, every prostitute receives a fee, but you give gifts to your lovers bribing them to come to you from everywhere for your illicit favors. Instead of getting a fee for being a prostitute, they're so insatiable in their desire for power. And so realize it boils down to, you know, really money, sex, and power that they were so insatiable in their lust for that, whether it was military power, you know, wealth. Uh, he says, you paid people in order to have sex with them, in order to form these alliances with them. Uh, he talks about exposing uh, their, their nakedness there in 37. Uh, 
and he talks about his jealousy, uh, like we see in Exodus 25, that I'm a, he's, he's jealous for our love and our affection uh, for him. Uh, you go on down, you see at the end of 43, verse 43, did you not add lewdness to all of your other detestable practices? Not being able to blush, we heard that back in uh, last semester, Jeremiah, forgetting how to blush. Yes, that we need to retain, a, have a sense of shame and not become jaded by maybe what we see on the TV or all so much that we even forget how to blush. Uh, 47, you became more depraved than they were. Look at 49. So we're still in chapter 16. Look at verse 49. Now, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Uh, now, that's, that's significant because if we said, you know, well, you know, while we're Sodom and Gomorrah overthrown, we might just say, well, it was homosexuality. And it doesn't say that it wasn't there because obviously they came to the door and they wanted, you know, they wanted uh, to have sex, bring the bring the, the angels of the Lord out, bring the, the men that were visitors from the Lord out. Doesn't mean that it didn't exist, but what does, what's significant is what the Lord calls up here in scripture. What was the sin of Sodom? arrogant, mm -hmm. overfed, mm -hmm. unconcerned about the poor and the needy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so instead of letting our minds always default to homosexuality, some of these can hit closer to home. Oh, yeah. uh, to be self-indulgent, uh, to be fat and sassy, uh, to have maybe a, 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 a strong sense of entitlement that we are entitled to these things. Uh, and that that's a, a death of discipleship entitlement in any form that I deserve this. And we have to guard against that because especially here in America, we hear that message in a lot of ways. You, you deserve it. You deserve this. Uh, and I often, I will nearly always think in my mind when I hear that, whether it's a commercial or in a movie or something, no, no. You know, even though our preamble uh, in alienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that would seem to suggest, hey, that is my right. Happiness, liberty, and when, but that, as good as some of the things are that our founding fathers did, that's not one of them in the sense that it says that is something I have a right to. Happiness and freedom. No, they're not, they're not rights. There's nothing that we are entitled to because of who we are, because of what nation. They're privileges, they're blessings for sure. But in the moment we begin treating something as that's my right to that, and you are in the way of that, you're treading on that. How dare you, you know, tread on my rights? You know, it creates a whole different spirit, a whole different defiant spirit, kind of like Sodom. Arrogant, full of self, overfed, self-indulgent, thinking they deserved all of these things, could care less about the poor and the needy. So always be on the guard against any kind of a sense of entitlement in our lives. What we, what we deserve is not so good. But what we get by the grace of God, wow, you know, he's so good to us. Oh, yeah. And I'm adopting an adage that I picked up. I was doing the book, Nancy Lee DeMoss, Choosing Gratitude. And she said uh, she was influenced by 93-year-old Mom Johnson, uh, who, when you ask, how are you doing? And I sometimes look at y'all, but sometimes I want to look at people online, too. He said, how are you doing? Mom Johnson would answer I have more blessings than problems. I think, well, that's good. And I'm repeating that to myself because, you know, sometimes we can start reciting our list of aches and pains, whether it's our own bodily aches and pains or 
family aches and pains are what's happening around us in the pandemic. I'm better than I deserve. I have more blessings than problems. And that will guard against a spirit of entitlement. Uh, I don't deserve anything except, you know, just punishment, me, myself. It's by the grace of God. So I pray that you keep that in mind. Mark that up in your Bible there about Sodom and verse 49 and, and following. He even goes on to say 51 Samaria, the northern kingdom, didn't commit half the sins that you did. Mm -hmm. Judah sat there and watched the northern kingdom go down this road of idolatry. So when they finally did it, they were like, we'll do it even more so. We'll outdo, we'll outdo them. Uh, you go on to 17. Uh, Eagle and the vine, son of man, I set forth an allegory and told the house of Israel a parable. Uh, all right, let me just see. Um, here, you look. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Unless someone was unmuting in order to say something, I think it can happen by accident sometime. But if you were uh, unmuting to say something, please, please do come back. I'm not. I'm not trying to squelch that. Uh, I just know how it can get off mute unintentionally. Uh, the allegory told uh, there in 17, the eagle and the vine. Uh, Babylon coming to pluck off. So this tree, Israel grown up, this, this eagle, Babylon comes and talks about it, leaves a remnant. But look, you skip all the way down. So it's going to be punishment from Babylon. But look in verse 22, 17, 22. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoot and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. And then it will become great. Uh, ultimately fulfilled in Christ, the shoot like Isaiah 53 or the other one that we had up previously, that Isaiah passage, what is it, 9 and 11, a shoot from the, the, the branch of David. 18, move on into to 18, the soul who sins uh, will die. Uh, so they had a proverb, you see right there in 18, the word of the Lord came to me, verse 1. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Uh, he says, as, sure, as I live, you will no longer quote this. Basically that, you know, the, the parents get to sow the wild oats and it's, it's going to be the kids who suffer for it. And he says, it's not going to be that way. Now, we, we need to understand some of that, you know, they, they've misunderstood it, but it can kind of have its roots previously, uh, even where the Lord, you know, earlier Moses would talk about, uh, you know, that uh, as far as those being disobedient and children to the third and fourth generation will suffer because of it. So, you know, it might have stemmed from that, but the Lord is saying clearly here, he establishes each person is responsible. We're not going to quote this any longer. We, we party, the children pay. Uh, he said, everyone, uh, you see there in verse four, every, every soul belongs to me, the father as well as the son. The soul who sins is the one who will die. And it just goes on and repeats. See, look at verse 20 again, 18, 20. The soul who sins is the one who will die. Uh, now, 21, he says, but if a wicked man turns away from the sins he's committed, if he repents, he will surely live and not die. Uh, so he goes in, and through that 18, he just, if there's someone who begins well and finishes poorly, they will be punished. 
but you can have someone who begins poorly and finishes well, and they will be rewarded. Uh, so that that principle, the Lord is fair. He knows how to, to judge fairly. So look at 18, 23. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord? But rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? So that, that'll that be repeated later in 33. Uh, it's like 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so again, uh, we can say, this gives us a guideline. You know, years ago when they took out bin Laden, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that we don't acknowledge, yes, violence will, will reap its own reward. But the difference with the people of God should just be that we're not the ones out dancing in the street or celebrating when even someone high profile like that is killed. The heart of God is, do I take delight in the death of bin Laden? Do I take delight in the death of? fill in the blank, Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot. He says, do I not rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their wicked ways and live? So that's telling for us and insightful. That's the heart of God, not delighting. It doesn't mean that justice isn't dealt out, but it's just the heart of God in the process. He doesn't delight in doing it. It's an alien task. It's a strange task for him to have to discipline in that way. And so we need to reflect the heart of our father and, and not ever delight in the death of someone that we might think was a wicked person against, against the ways of God. They're making this case against God. Uh, verse 25, you say the way of the Lord is not just. Hear, O house of Israel, is my way unjust? It is your ways that are unjust. And he goes on. Look at, uh, we talked about repentance. Look at 30. House of Israel, I will judge you, each one according to his ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfalls. Rid yourselves of the offenses. Get a new heart and a new spirit. Where are, you, where are we going to get a new heart and a new spirit? We're going to conjure it up ourselves? It's going to come from the Lord. Then he repeats that again in 32. I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, not just the wicked. I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. One teacher said, get a new heart, a new spirit. That means we need to change our play, our play things, our play places, our play friends. Whenever we're changing our ways, turning to the Lord, it, probably means we're going to have to change some things in our in our lives but there is that that term repent there uh, 19 is the allegory of the dangerous lion uh, goes on through that go on to 20 because we'll be uh, we'll probably just make it even a, just a few minutes early uh, here today. Uh, rebellious Israel and this one place oh it will be verse 9 uh, look at look at go down to verse 9 but for the sake of my name I did what would keep it from being profaned in the eyes of the nations for the sake of his own name the message translation there says i acted out of who i was not what i felt so god wasn't acting out of you know a spate of anger uh just not out of just a uh, a knee-jerk reaction just a hmm? i think okay uh yeah, all right. It wasn't, wasn't a question there. Uh, I acted out of who I was, not how I felt. 
And so I acted for the sake of my name to keep it from being profaned. And even today, you know, the Lord is at work doing that for the sake of his name. But we as we want to have the heart of like the psalmist, that may I never bring shame on the name, the name of God, the name of Jesus, uh, by the way that that we live or that we act high profile. And of course, media is going to be quick to jump on those who are poor ambassadors, whether it's a, a church out of Kansas or somebody out of Florida. It's going to, that's, it's in, inevitable. That's going to get profiled and put up there. But we just want to keep acting in accordance with the glory that God deserves and the way that we treat people, the way that we dialogue even with people on, quote, the other side of the street from us, that nothing ever merits unchristlike behavior, uh, disrespect. You know, disagreement does not merit disrespect. We can disagree with somebody, a lifestyle, a choice, a party's position. Uh, our culture says if you disagree with it, you, you can disrespect them. But that's not the way of God. Uh, go on. Uh, I just just noting, I'm sorry, 2011, God saying, I gave Israel and all my decrees and made them known to, the, to them my laws for the man who obeys them will live by them. Also, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between us, the Lord giving Sabbath as a sign, not as a not as a legalistic thing that must be observed. The purpose of Sabbath is basically an act of faith. If because we as people can operate on the premise that, man, unless I work 24-7, 365, you know, I'm not going to make it. If I don't look out for me, nobody is. And that's an act, that's a that's a posture of, of un, you know, of faithlessness. Yeah, of course we need to be diligent and work, but have a trust in the Lord to where we can stop and honor the Lord on a day of the week and my dad was good about that growing up on the farm for the most part we took a break on sundays not legalistically but in the spirit of uh the lord will take care of us even if we miss an irrigation set on one day the lord will take care of us so i appreciate kind of the way that he instilled that but that's the bigger purpose of Sabbath. It's, an, it's a statement of trust in the Lord. Uh, you look at 26, 2026, there's that statement. Um, uh, I let them become defiled through their gifts, the sacrifice of every firstborn that I might fill them with horror and they would know that I am the Lord. There's a continued emphasis to know that I am the Lord, that that's kind of the, the spirit of Romans 1. When people get hell-bent on rebellion, the Lord can turn them over to the desires of their hearts, uh, give them the desires of, the, of their hearts and see how, you know, how horrible that is. Uh, so 20 there is a lot about uh, defiling the name of the Lord and what he did for the sake of uh, his name in saying that they would not listen to Ezekiel look at the end of chapter 20 and you go all the way verse 49 the last verse of chapter 20 I said all sovereign Lord they are saying of me isn't he just telling parables uh, it's and they'll repeat that 33 oh he's just these are just love songs these are just parables so the people, the leaders out in captivity with him were, were minimizing. They were diminishing the importance of what, ah, these are just stories. There's nothing to it. Uh, go 21 is Babylon, the sword uh, of God's judgment. Uh, so he's going to be using the Babylonians 
to, to punish them, keep going uh, further on into 21 there. Uh, it will be verse 26. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, take off the turban, remove the crown. It will not be as it was. The lowly will be exalted and the exalted will be brought low uh, on the day of punishment by the Babylonians. Uh, 27, a ruin, a ruin, I will make it a ruin. It will not be restored until he comes to whom it rightfully belongs. To him I will give it. There's a bit of a anticipation of the messianic age. So the temple being desecrated, destroyed, and, and it says it won't be restored until he comes. That's, that uses the language of Genesis 49.10 when Israel was blessing the 12 sons and he comes to Judah, the scepter will not depart from Judah until he comes to whom it belongs, till, uh, you know, till the Messiah comes. This is the Messiah here, but when Jesus appears in the temple, yeah, Herod's temple, he appears there in the temple, but not that the focus is on all of this grand temple. The disciples say that, look how grand this temple is. And, the, and Jesus' response, I tell you, not one stone's going to be left on the other. Don't be enamored with this magnificent building. So Jesus comes as the one to whom it all belonged, the true temple of God in the flesh. Of course, men, Jews, through the Romans, crucified him, but then he's resurrected and vindicated. So that whole thing, that just that prophecy, the one to whom it rightfully belongs, 22 is, is more about the sins of Jerusalem. Look all the way to the end of 22 uh, as a watchman. And this, we need to hear this. You may remember this verse. Verse 30, chapter 22, verse 30. I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it, but I found none. So I'll pour out my wrath on them. Uh, of course, for intercessors, that, that verse will be used, the importance of intercessory prayer. Uh, God's looking for people who will stand in the gap on behalf of people and intercede so they won't have to be destroyed. And so even for America, we can talk about, you know, how bad it is, how bad things are getting. Again, the phrase going to hell in a handbasket. But what God is interested in is not focusing on the darkness God isn't interested in standing back and cursing the darkness. He wants us to be light. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine in the darkness. Be among them. Live among them. Develop relationships. Let your light shine in the darkness. We're there. Uh, we're there as intercessors on behalf of the land. We're there as, you know, as watchmen on behalf of the land. So not just talking about. It's rather worthless. Just stand back. And to just talk about, oh, judgment's coming on America. It's coming on America. Not that there can't be a prophetic word. There may be. But for us, our, our dialogue doesn't need to be just about, oh, waiting until God's going to punish. He's looking for, he's not looking for naysayers. He's not looking for doomsayers. He's looking for men and women who will stand in the gap on behalf of the land so that it won't be destroyed. And that, that needs to be us, that we are praying, First Timothy 2, praying for all of those in positions of authority. 23, another allegory, two promiscuous sisters. And they are the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. They are Israel and Judah versus, verse four, their names. The older was named Ohola and her sister, Ohaliba, Oholiba. Ohola is Samaria and Oholiba is Jerusalem. And so it goes on and tells the story of them being promiscuous. But look at 17. This is the nature of sin. Then the Babylonians came to her to, and this is primarily to the southern kingdom. It wasn't the Babylonians to the northern kingdom, the Syrians. They were destroyed before the Babylonians came on the scene. The Babylonians came to the to Judah, the southern kingdom, verse 17, to the bed of love. And in their lust, they defiled her. After she had been defiled by them, she turned away from them in disgust. 
she carried on her prostitution, goes to Egypt. So she, she gets in bed politically and militarily with, with uh, Babylon. And then she's disgusted with them. Don't you remember the story of back in uh, 2 Samuel 13, Amnon, one of David's sons, and now he lusted for his half-sister Tamar. And when he finally had his way with her and raped her, then he couldn't stand to look at her. And that's, that's the nature of sin, like that, the nature of lust. Uh, it, when, it, when it uses something, then it will despise that, e even with her, uh, you know, in tears, saying, no, take me to be your wife. Don't, don't, don't shame me in this way. Uh, and so it's just that nature of it lusted after other lovers, the Egyptians. Uh, and it gets explicit even there in 20 and talking about she lusted after her lovers whose genitals were like those of donkeys, you know, and just talking about the Egyptians and the Babylonians. And, and so we need to be careful, of course, for us in America, one way, it's not necessarily alliances with other nations, but we can make a God of military might and power. But Psalm 20 should give us some guard against that. Some, like, was it 27 or 2010? Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some may trust in military might, but we trust in God. And so it doesn't mean that we're not thankful for, it doesn't mean we don't pray for the military and, and soldiers. It's just that that's not our Lord. And that's not our savior. Yes, Cynthia. I just thought about it. It's amazing how on our porn we have in God we trust. Yeah. Yeah. On our coins, our money, in God we trust. But we're trusting in our military might. Our might or our or like the greenback itself, or trusting yeah. in the sign of, of wealth itself. Yeah. And the whole foundation should be. Now, these are peripheral matters, the military might, the, the wealth, these are peripheral. What center stage is the Lord trusting in him? And someone said that Jesus is, is Jesus is teaching? Uh, yes, and Jesus is teaching. Uh, he elevates trust in God. He speaks more about trust in God, faith in God, than he does about just even loving God. It's there, Matthew 22, 35, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. So he does mention that, but he speaks more often, many more times, about trusting God, faith in God, that that is what's crucial, that you and I, we look at our lives during the pandemic and everything, and what ways can we be trusting in God in this instead of feeling, you know, fearful. It doesn't mean that we don't need to be wise about uh, the spread of it. Of course, we, we do take precautions, but that we trust in the Lord, and that we don't get let the church or let us as Christians get in a, a bunker mentality, that we just got to hang in there uh, until he comes or until this is over. Uh, the last thing as we near the end here, 23, Chapter 23, verse 35, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says, since you have forgotten me and thrust me behind your back, you must bear the consequences of your lewdness and prostitution. Just that principle of, he says, you, Judah, have turned your back on me. So again, it's this, this thing of turning our, our back on God. So just look at our lives and make sure there's no way, is there any way that we or the church that we're a part of is, we're turning our backs on the Lord. And uh, of course, then finishing up in our, in our uh, time today is the last one, the cooking pot, another symbol. And then in 24, the latter part, 15 and following Ezekiel's wife dies. And it seems that you know, this is a good or a tender relationship. The word of the Lord, verse 15, came to me, son of man, with unblow, I'm about to take away from you. And what is, what does he call her? The delight of your eyes. 
I said, God sounds ruthless there, but we uh, keep the bigger picture in mind. You don't yet do not lament or weep or shed any tears. Groan quietly. Do not mourn for the dead. Go through their processes of mourning for the dead. Keep your turban fastened, your sandals on your feet. 18, so I spoke to the people in the morning and in the evening my wife died. The next morning I did as the Lord had commanded. Then the people asked me, what do these things have to do with us? They notice it's very different behavior. Somebody's wife dies, they would have gone through these other rituals. And he says, I, I say to you, uh, so you move on down in the point he, to the people, it's about the temple in Jerusalem. Look at verse 25, 24, 25. And you, son of man, on the day I take away their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes and their heart's desire, and their sons and daughters as well, on that day a fugitive will come to tell you the news. And that's what happens later on here. At that time, your mouth will be opened and you will speak with them and will no longer be silent. So the delight of his eyes was his wife for the Jews and in exile and back in Jerusalem, the, their delight was the temple and was Jerusalem itself. And the Lord says, I'm about to take that away, but they didn't even have, wouldn't have time to mourn because they would be carried away into exile, uh, even as it happened. Well, that is the material that we needed uh, to cover today and coming in at just under the wire one o'clock a few minutes so i appreciate all of those of you online that were with us today and those of you here and so stretched it out where uh, the thing that i was trying to think of earlier probably had to do about the lessons i emailed them to you i said if you need a hard copy let us know uh, I stretched it out where we don't meet again for three weeks and then it'll get to be, it'll get to be four weeks, but the middle of February, I believe the 13th is our is our next one. So any of you that are able to come here, I'd be delighted to have you. Otherwise, we will join back online in the same way. So Lord be with you throughout this weekend into the coming week and we will say goodbye for now. Thank, Thank you, Kirk. You, Kirk. That, that was, was a great, great class. class. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Samba, each of you there. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, uh, Tolu, I know what I was trying to think of. Anybody that hasn't filled out a registration form, so Tolu, if you would go online and do that. Uh, Ed, if you wanted to grab one there. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Lynette, I see you're unmuted, but I haven't gotten to meet you. Maybe sometime. We'll get to meet you and Carrie uh, new, uh, maybe at some point get to, to meet you as well. Uh, so very good to, to have you all with us today. We'll just meet virtually. What was that? I say we will just meet virtually. Yeah, right. Yeah, kidding. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Goodbye to, to all of you.